I'm Sean Taylor, and welcome to this special edition of Hustle, Play, Love, a Hustle double feature. Now, anybody who knows me knows I'm a foodie and I love to cook. And I've picked up some cute nicknames over the years for my lavish dinner parties. Some of my friends even call me Auntie Sean, and I've been known to answer to Chef Sean, too. I'm inspired by cuisines I've tasted from all over the world, but I will tell anybody anywhere that Chicago's food scene is one of the best on the planet. We're blessed with diversity and talent, and thankfully, chefs who are willing to take risk. And that, my friends, is what's happened to soul food in recent years. Favorites like mac and cheese and collard greens, catfish, shrimp etouffee, and chicken and waffles have crossed over from soul food kitchens to mainstream menus. But Chicago chefs who specialize in Southern comfort cuisine are leading an evolution in what we have historically thought of as soul food. They're cross-pollinating cultures to create culinary masterpieces most of us have never even seen before. It's made me step up my kitchen game. Now I can throw down, but my culinary skills are nothing compared to my next guest. Quentin Love has owned numerous Chicago eateries focused on healthier choices in the city's food deserts. He most recently opened the Soul Food Lounge restaurants in Chicago's North Lawndale and Beverly communities, where he fuses soul foods from other cultures into traditional Southern dishes. Quentin, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. And I'd also like to welcome Jamie Gilmore. She has trained under leading executive chefs and has been influenced by cuisines around the world but her first lessons came at the hip of her mother and grandmother. Having worked for years as an event planner, Jamie now runs a full-service catering company and is the owner of Lizzie J Cafe, one of Chicago's premier spots for breakfast and brunch located in Fulton Market. Jamie, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, and at the last minute. And I know how hard that is for people in the restaurant business. Um, I used to be in the restaurant business with this guy right here, <laughs> years and years ago. So I, I got to thinking, the reason I wanted to have you guys on today is because I'm seeing so much innovation in black kitchens, black, black culinary kitchens these days. Um, Quentin, you have the Soul Food Lounge. Mm -hmm. um, you have Lizzie J Cafe. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to test a theory out with you guys real quick. There is definitely a reimagining going on of soul food. And I'm wondering, has it been partially driven by the appropriation of soul food by mainstream restaurants? Is there any truth to that? Well, I don't know. I, yeah, I'm not. I'm so busy creating. I don't think about, <laughs> you know, what's going on outside of me, right? I mean, it's like when you just, you in that zone, you just want to just create, and because we go to other restaurants, of course, but mm -hmm. when it's finally your turn to do something, mm -hmm. you just get out there and just do it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's so different. So like, you know, you, you used to have to go to Roscoe Chicken and Waffles to get chicken and waffles. Right. Now you can get it at the Holiday Inn. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's like. And it's not, it's not bad. It's good. It's good chicken. Right. You know, so, but I mean, taking it to another level, I mean, is that part of how you're able to really stay relevant and compete in, in this market? I don't believe there's a competition. I believe that there's space for everyone. But mm -hmm. to your to your point, I do believe um, as a capitalist country, mm -hmm. um, the opportunities um, that other uh, industries see and they see the thriving businesses uh, that African Americans are able to produce, they think that they can reproduce our dishes. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally believe that they're missing one component. Uh, our dishes are, are birthed out of love. Our dishes are birthed uh, over communications, over celebrations. Mm -hmm. So, um, yep, you, you could make a chicken and waffle, but your chicken and waffle is not going to taste like ours because like mm -hmm. my brother said, we are basing our thing, it's our turn, it's our opportunity. So we are giving out our very best and we're not leaving any crumbs for anybody else. So I don't think there's competition And the most ever. important thing is that we, we know we go into the kitchen, we taste the food, like we, we spend a lot of time and passion curating that and not, we know we trust our team, but really we trust our palates, mm -hmm. you know? And because it's all about you got to have a winning palate. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. <laughs> now, both of you um, learned cooking from your uh, matriarchs in your family. Quinn, right. I know your grandmother taught you a lot of what you know. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, Jamie, you said you, your mother and grandmother taught you a lot of what you know. So, I mean, pushing past those ideas, like where do you get inspiration from? Quentin, you have... You have brought in all these other cultures, right. brought soul food from other cultures, mm -hmm. spices from other cultures, and blended them in to soul food. Like, 
when people eat it, I know they're like, how did he even come up with this concept? Are yeah. you just constantly in test kitchen mode? You're always in test kitchen mode. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever I go to another <laughs> restaurant, I'm always thinking about a way to tweak it or enhance it from another culture's perspective, mm -hmm. right? So I'm not just thinking about traditional meatloaf. I'm thinking about how can I create a Mediterranean meatloaf, mm -hmm. right? How can I infuse the flavors of, of the Middle East into a Southern dish, right? Mm -hmm. And so then you just kind of just continue to go on that journey. And because as you're talking about, anybody can make a chicken and waffle, right? Mm -hmm. But how are you making a chicken and waffle in, on another level so people can have a better experience eating the chicken and waffle that is traditionally down, now done by everyone across the world. Right. But we should have perfected it in such a way we can do it with our eyes closed and then add a little touch to it and be like, oh, yours just tastes so different and so special. I want yours. Mm -hmm. I mean, you did that with your chicken, you mm -hmm. know, with the honey glaze. It's, it's, it's very different. It's not just fried chicken. Yeah, fi fire maple, fire maple glaze. Fire maple with the glaze. Fried pound, with, the, with the fried grilled pound cake. With fried grilled pound cake. I mean, right there, pound cake, mm -hmm. fried and grilled. Whoever, you know, that, that, that is an innovation. It's, it's a whole new concept. Um, so Jamie, um, when I looked at your menu, oh my God, I got so hungry. I'm like, I'm so <laughs> glad I found out about um, your, your location in Fulton Market. You're in a great lo location. Mm -hmm. So you went from event planner to restaurant owner. Mm -hmm. So how did you make that shift? What, what inspired you to do that? Honestly, it was just being in the right place at the right time. <clears throat> Excuse me. It was more so a necessity. Um, mm -hmm. I say that it chose me. Um, I simply did a dinner for a friend and the person said, we're going to make room for you. And they simply mm. pushed me into a space where we could produce things that were in my mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, of course, like I said, I cook with my grandmother, but like, I love the idea. I'm going to have to borrow that. The fried, that? The fried that? pound cake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, hmm, I'm going to have to give that a try. Mm -hmm. But our waffle is not a traditional just add water and stir. Mm -hmm. We actually do a yeast waffle because it, it rises. It has a little crispiness to it because I, I like the balance. I like the different taste and the different textures. Mm -hmm. So um, the event planning is seeing all different types of cuisine and saying, I could do that better than that. And I can do that with more passion. So that's kind of how my the introduction of food kind of happened for me. And it's really, you know, about the wow. You know, how do you really wow people? I mean, to, to look, I've been in your restaurants and I've watched people. I love to watch people's faces mm -hmm. when they taste your food. It's kind of like this. And then it's like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know. You got to love that, right, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, if we I can find this moments. picture of my cousin when I took her there leaning, she got up and she leaned against the wall. She was like, oh, God, you know, I mean, it is an experience. It is like running a marathon. It's like winning a race. It, it, it's just it's so it's so different. Um, and you have two restaurants yes. with two different menus. Yep. And I keep saying that is insane. I don't know anybody who does that. Why go that extra mile to create all two different menus? I, don't, I just don't want you to get bored. I mean, right now the restaurant scene is so amazing. There's, there's like, there's so many great restaurants right now on the scene right now. You can't just continue to reinvent the wheel. You got to mm -hmm. go out there. You got to be innovative. That's right. Because Chicago, we were talking what I about, say, best on the planet. We were so you talking about compete. lamb chops earlier. I'm like, okay, so how you doing yours? What's mm -hmm. your price? You know, what is it? And should I do lamb chops? Because everybody else is doing lamb chops. I mean, I do lamb chops. But if I do them, how, how is mine going to be more different from hers? But they both are great, mm -hmm. right? So I'm going to get lamb shops at the sofa lounge. So I'm going to go over here and get it. I'm going to go over there and get it. So it's, I got 27 items, and I want you to, I'm just taking you on a journey globally mm -hmm. yeah. to eat that, mm -hmm. right? So you're going to eat my grandmother's dressing infused with a lobster tail. You're going to go, you're going to get my version of a tamale. You know, but uh, from a Creole perspective, and I'm not from New no, Louisiana, but I have the essence of it because I understand the, the food and understand the mm -hmm. ingredients. So, okay, but I've, I've always loved Chinese food. So I'm going to give you my version of orange chicken, my version of honey walnut mm -hmm. shrimp, mm -hmm. right? So my version of fried rice. Now, fried rice is being done everywhere right now, but you haven't had mine infused with mm -hmm. the other part of the dish. Right? That's, that's awesome. So it's just and, just, and enjoying it. And, when you do, and so when, like, when we, go, we go into our restaurants and we go in and we taste the food, and if we still can enjoy it and we understand our palate, we know you're going to like it too. Now, you, you brought up a good point about like lamb chops. You know, those are expensive menu items, right? right. So, um, Jamie, are you finding that, um, you know, certainly competing is also 
prices are going up. Mm -hmm. I mean, these, these these are upscale dishes. This is an upscale brunch menu. This is an upscale um, dinner menu. Mm -hmm. um, how are people, you know, dealing with the, the increases for what they consider comfort food at one point, uh, really competing um, um, with other restaurants in Chicago? I think people pay for what they enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that if you have a fair, and we, we have a generous portion, so if mm -hmm. you don't feel like you're being cheated or slighted, I always think of it as the art of the deal. So mm -hmm. if you are enjoying the food, if it was appetizing to you when you first looked at it, and then once you enjoy it and you ingest it, you feel like you got a great bargain, then people are going to come back and they're going to tell their friends about mm -hmm. it. So there's so, been no pushback, oh, this is soul food, you know, well, who said soul food was inexpensive? Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Oxtails cost well, where? more now than, than beef tenderloin. How about that? That's <laughs> it's, because it's been made popular. It's been made very popular, mm -hmm. exactly. So um, what's next for both of you? I mean, uh, is it just more creativity? Is it more going back into the lab, Quentin? Uh, definitely soul food now. Three is in the works. More menu items, more creativity. Just I'm just... I'm going for it. This is this is the time to do so, and so let's do it. You're a mad scientist, man. Might as and, well. And what about <laughs> you, Jamie? I want to uh, franchise with the concept. I, my idea is to be what I, I didn't have when I started. Um, so I know that there are tons of people like me who began and didn't have anywhere or any direction to go. So if I can give them a template to help them do something with standard operations, I think that I can help people give birth to, to their own little babies. And how can people find out more about Lizzie J Cafe? So you can simply go to lizzyjcafe.com on all platforms. You can also go to It's Jamie Gilmore on Instagram. Um, that's also my email address as well. Okay. And Quentin, how can we find out more about Soul Food Lounge? Uh, the quentinlove.net. You're definitely going to learn all about me and just the journey. The soulfoodlounge.com, turkeyshop.com, bikekettle.com. Just, just come and have an experience. Great guest, great segment, guys. Thanks for joining us. We will be right back. On the next Chicago Newsroom 2.0, we'll take a closer look at Chicago's very real and very significant image problem with Roundtable regulars Samantha Thomas, Hugo Balta, and Francia Garcia Hernandez. Join the conversation Wednesday at 7 p.m. on Can TV, cable channel 19, or stream live on CanTV.org or on the new Can TV Plus app. Experience the power of community television. Welcome back. I am super excited to talk to my next guest. She is the very definition of what it's like to push past the new normal. Since 2020, she has won two Emmy Awards for her hit daytime syndicated talk show, now in its fifth season, launched a television crime series, and written two novels. Now she's working on a cookbook, exploring her passion for cooking, and all this while becoming a new mom. I've been a fan of her since she was a reporter on Fox Chicago, and I followed her as she rose to national celebrity. So it was more than an honor. It was a dream come true to have the opportunity to collaborate with her on her first two novels in the Jordan Manning mystery series, as The Wicked Watch and the latest Watch Where They Hide, which celebrates its official release today. It's an edge-of-your-seat thriller. TV news reporter Jordan Manning investigates the case of a missing mother and uncovers a web of secrets that could put her own life in danger. I'm talking about none other than Chicago's adopted daughter from Luling, Texas, Tamron Hall. Hello, how are you? Hello, it's always so good to see your face. And you know, this is how we're used to looking at each other. 90% <laughs> of our relationship has been in a little box in two different parts of the country, but it's always a connection. It's always a connection. I'm so excited. Uh, we've got the, our book, the books are right here. Um, it drops today. Um, it's so exciting. So happy publication day and congratulations. Yeah. Um, so, Watch Where They Hide is the second in the Jordan Manning series. Uh, As the Wicked Watch, bestseller. People have been anticipating this book for a very, very long time. As the Wicked Watch really pointed out the disparities in the way investigations of missing black women and girls are, are, are done versus white women. So 
What do readers have to look forward to with this new novel, Watch Where They Hide? Well, this new one, Sean, as you know, as is is inspired by cases that I actually covered with Deadline Crime, which was the show I had for six seasons, but also inspired by my many, many years, 10 of the great years of my career spent in Chicago. And Mm -hmm. this particular story, I wanted to take the reader in a different direction for a couple of very important reasons. When I first pitched this book to publishers, they first said, you know, there's not a character like this, a black female protagonist written by a black female journalists solving mm-hmm. crime. So this does not exist in the entire thriller genre. And I couldn't believe it. And, you know, I lived in Chicago for 10 years. We are about breaking the rules, breaking down the stereotypes, breaking down those barriers. And Absolutely. I said, how is this possible? Right. So let me tackle this, this project. And I was so happy to have you as a collaborator on this wild ride of bringing this character that doesn't exist in, in any form, as we were told by publishers at the time, mm-hmm. in, in this in this genre. So the first, the first book was inspired by the Ryan Harris case, which was one of the first cases that I covered when I moved to Chicago. I could not shake that case, but what a lot of people didn't yeah. know at the time was that same year I was a reporter in Texas in 1997 and covered the disappearance and murder of another child. And so these through lines just always haunted me. So I launched in with the first book. The second book, it was very intentional to have this Jordan Manning character follow the the disappearance of a woman who also happened to be white. Because Mm -hmm. the first book focused on missing black girls, there was this notion of, oh, well, it's a black book. And I said, this is a book about a reporter. A mm-hmm. reporter who is sometimes compromising her job and putting herself in these dangerous situations to find the truth. And that's what you do as a reporter every day. When I was in Chicago, I couldn't yep. walk in the newsroom and say, I only want to cover stories on the west side. I only want to cover stories, you know, <laughs> on the south side or whatever. Or I will only do stories about women. My job as a reporter was to cover the job and cover the story that I was assigned that day. Yeah. So with this latest novel, It's inspired by the disappearance of two women that I covered, but also inspired by the truth of reporting, which is you don't get to pick the assignment. What Jordan does get to pick is how she covers the assignment. And what we see again is that she goes way deep into her desire to find justice. And that's Mm -hmm. the story. And she's, I mean, she's special as a reporter because she also has a forensic background. Um, And because it's a a novel, we can have some fun with it, right? So, um, I mean, Jordan reminds us of ourselves. You know, and bonus. You know, she's yeah. she's also you know a forensic uh, scientist. Yeah. She yeah. Um, she has this this gene within her that makes her want to do more than just cover the story, and that's what makes this exciting. And that's what makes it a novel. Yeah. But it's interesting that a character that can remind us so much of ourselves had mm-hmm. not existed, which to me right there just talks about the importance of why this novel needed to happen and why this character needed to be introduced. But you didn't have to do it in Chicago, and I'm just c- curious, yeah. why did you anchor her here? Because so much of my career was anchored in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Um, I wouldn't be in New York with a national syndicated show if I didn't spend those 10 years in Chicago, much like Jordan, who starts out in Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, When I moved to Chicago in 97, it's a great friend of mine who's a member of the NABJ, Steve Pickett. I always give him a shout out. And at the time, (laughs) I don't know if a lot of people know this in Chicago, I was offered two jobs um, in Chicago and one in Miami. And I was on the fence about where I wanted to go. Obviously, I'm 27, so the allure of hanging out in Miami uh, was obviously appealing. But my friend Steve said to me, go to Chicago. It's a news town. Mm-hmm. And it's a town that really will boost your 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 career, but also it will make you a solid reporter. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, Miami and South Beach, versus Michigan, Lake Michigan and and 30 below. I'll take the Lake Michigan and 30 below because it was important for me and is important that I put this career of this lucky, I feel like the luckiest person on the planet, but that I put it to great use, much like Jordan, when you just mentioned that Jordan Mm -hmm. really wants to, she's inspired by my career, but also something that I could never express she gets to cross the line to find out, you know, who did it and why. In the intro of my show, Deadline Crime, it says, you know, I don't want to know just how it happened. I want to know why. Why it happened. For me as a reporter, I could 
report what the authorities said or police or witnesses or even the uh, family members of someone who was involved with a crime. But Jordan gets far more intimate and far deeper than I could have ever if I was going to keep my career. And that's what's so juicy about this character. That's the yeah. fantasy of it. That's the fiction of it. Is that yes. I'm able to explore her. I, I remember one night, the first book, I was watching um, something on television, some Netflix thing, and this mm -hmm. guy, he was a crime solver, and he's getting punched, and he's fighting, and he's got climbing. Uh, and I wanted that for Jordan. So that's where, I won't really give too much away, in the first book, if you haven't read it, that's where this scene comes in where she's mm -hmm. walking through the parking lot. I had insomnia. But I also wanted her to be more than a reporter. I wanted her to cross that line. I grew up watching Columbo and Police Lady and yes, all these yes. characters. I wanted her to be a true crime solver, not just a reporter. Mm -hmm. And you have really occupied this crime space um, very well in the past few years. You mentioned your show, Deadline Crime with Tamron Hall. I was a big fan of that show. Um, and so now with the novel, so you have really, you're, you're occupying, this, occupying the space hugely, um, the crime narrative and the mystery narrative um, as a black female writer. Yeah, you know, and it wasn't by design, to be quite honest with you. When I um, first pitched um, this Jordan Manning character, which for people who don't know, Michael Jordan Peyton Manning, that's how her <laughs> name came to be. A little um, Chicago shout out. <laughs> yeah, I vividly remember I just uh, left the Today Show and we started, you know, with ideas and people were approaching me about a memoir. I had folks approaching about, you know, beauty books and inspirational books. And those are things that I definitely have my sights set on. But mm -hmm. For me, I could never shake Ryan Harris. And it mm -hmm. was always in my gut. And I played with different versions. Even before you and I met, I played with different versions of how I was going to tell this story, right? What vantage point? And over time, it just started to evolve. But I kept my North Star, which was the Ryan Harris case. Mm -hmm. And what and I learned unforgettable, on the horrible. ground there. Yeah, of mm -hmm. course. I, I mean, even in the first book, of um, As the Wicked Watch, I vividly remember standing in front of that field where she was found and never forgetting and not you're not supposed to, right? And that's what what's so important yeah. about a character like Jordan. I got an opportunity through her to explain what it feels like, what what that 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 hollow of your soul feels like when you go home. And you've covered something so heinous all day yeah. long, or you've sat in a courtroom and you've heard testimony that you'd like to forget, but you can't. And this was liberating for me to be able to say, honestly, that as a human being, you're not supposed to see this kind of thing and forget it. And, and through forget Jordan, it. I'm able to mm -hmm. show the real life, um, the real life, I don't, I, I'm careful with the word struggle, because, but the real life challenge of being a crime reporter yeah and i know and we really connected crime, there too but it's crime yeah it's crime we connected on that because i used to cover crime so i remember mm -hmm. first conversation we had yeah. it was back and forth what you know nightmare you know stories of, of yeah. covering these crimes you're yeah. right it does stick with you and you do cry later when you get home um but i also wanted to talk to you about some other work you're doing because you you are a serial entrepreneur i think people might miss that because you're a broadcast journalist they see you on television but yeah. you've got a lot of things going on you're executive producer of your show in its fifth season. The show just keeps getting better and better. It's so much fun. It is, it is totally occupied my DVR. <laughs> now you're working on a cookbook. And I, yeah. I know you're a foodie. I know you're a foodie deep yeah. down because we've talked about food and you've got yeah. me on chicken breast and I mean off chicken <laughs> breast and totally on chicken thighs. Thank you for that. But um, talk about the cookbook and, and what inspired you to do that? Well, the cookbook was inspired when I moved here from Chicago my dad and mom would visit all the time. And when I came to New York within the first year, my dad passed away. And in my family, my dad was the primary cook. I mean, people would laugh at me and they'd say, oh, you know, what, what's your mom's favorite recipe? I'm like, uh, my mom's favorite recipe is whatever my dad cooked, you know, and he did all of the cooking. And when he passed yeah. away, I knew we would miss so much about my dad, of course, but his, his, his cooking and not just the flavors or the food, but the, the love of feeding his family, you know, mm -hmm. the love of bringing my lunch um, to school, or even when I was visiting Chicago, the love of, you know, getting in the kitchen and, and preparing something for me in my first apartment that I'd ever bought, you know? And so when he passed away, uh, I went to visit my mother 
and there was nothing our first holiday. And I was like, we can't go out like this, you know? And so Mm -hmm. a dear friend of mine gave me a gift certificate for a cooking class. And it set off this journey of really as a love letter to my father to learn to cook. And I ended up befriending um, a food stylist who is a chef, a brilliant chef, but she was part of the food styling team at the Today Show. We became great friends and she shepherded me through what we call becoming a confident cook. And so the book is Mm. um, done, it's beautiful. It's full of recipes. Um, Lish Styling is my dear friend and chef who's from Wisconsin. Um, and we got together and created, it's almost like a, it's a photo album. It's a picture book of like my dad and my family, my friends and my son oh, combined with these great recipes and stories. But it is about communal and the spirit of it. The thing I miss most, I have to tell you, Sean, even all these years later, um, I miss Sunday dinners at my parents' house. Uh, yeah, my first TV special. job was in Dallas, Fort Worth. I'd drive over on Sunday. So this is a love letter um, mm-hmm. to that. And that was the inspiration. I love that. I, I just recently lost my father. And so I can definitely understand the sentiment. I can't wait to see it. Um, I heard you're going to be popping up on some book clubs. So we're going to be following you to see where yes. you're going to end up. You've got a lot coming up with the tour. How can people get their hands on this wonderful book. Oh my gosh, well you can go to wherever books are sold, but you can also go to tamarinhall.tv, which now we have like this one-stop shop of everything that I'm doing. But yeah, wherever your books are sold, so that celebrate and um, of course, support your local book dealers and, and bookstores. But for me, honestly, I gotta tell you, just that folks read the first one, that they're curious about the second, I am blown away because I never thought, this was a huge leap of faith for me. I'm now 53 years old. I moved to Chicago when I was 27. Wow. So hard to believe, but it's a journey and I hope people go and check out Jordan Manning and all of her shenanigans. Well, I wanna thank you for joining me on my show. I'm, be, I'm, I'm You're rubbing off on me, Tamron. I'm now, now I'm doing a talk show, so something's going on here. Thank you very much and much success to for you, everything that you're doing, your show, thank your you. cookbook, and the novels. We'll be right back. I'm Hugo Valta, host of the program, Three Questions With. Latino workers face unique challenges in the workplace including low wages, discrimination, lack of access to quality health care, and unsafe working conditions. And the vision of Grassroots Collaborative is to challenge corporate power and inequality to make our communities thriving, sustainable. Join us on Wednesdays at 7.30 in the evening via Channel 19, streaming on CanTV.org and the Can TV Plus app. Welcome back, and thank you so much for tuning in to tonight's Hustle Double Feature. I'd like to thank my guest, Tamron Hall, for sharing her inspiring story of serial entrepreneurship. Chicago is here for it, and we're here for you, Tamron. Best of luck to you in all your endeavors. And chefs Quentin Love and Jamie Gilmore, thank you for making me hungry (laughs) and giving us some insight into the evolution of soul food and for driving that innovation. Much success to you both. I hope you've been inspired by what you've heard here tonight. Because who said you can only do one thing? You can do two, three, or four things all at once if you want to. And you can always pivot and take your craft to another level. Pursue your passions. If anybody is telling you that you can't do something, just make sure that person isn't you. I'll be back next week with an all new episode of Hustle Play Love. You can rewatch the show on cantv.org or download the CanTV Plus app. Until then, stay on your hustle, play like you mean it, and love like there's no tomorrow. I'm Sean Taylor. Good night.